Hey there guys, alright, today we're back with Baz Battles, which I have watched a couple of his videos in the past, years ago, but this time we are doing something new. We're going to be watching a battle video from a fantasy series. This is something I've not done yet, um, so I'm curious how this, well, we've kind of done it with Warhammer, sort of, but like, this is going to be done in the style of how we see, like, you know, Kings and Generals, Baz Battles, previous videos that I have watched, um, where they do that sort of um, showcasing of how the battle went down or whatever. Um, I'm curious about this because, I mean, I love A Song of Ice and Fire. I've read all the books except for, I think, the A World of, of A Song of Ice and Fire. I don't think I've world, read the World uh, Encyclopedia book yet. I do. I want to. Um, but I've been holding off on getting it. Um, but I love the series. I've really loved this this book series. Uh, this book series is what helped me get back into reading, and it ultimately is what inspired me to start writing again. Um, so like as I've said before in previous videos, um, my first like couple books, my first book especially, um, was very much just me mimicking, trying to mimic George R. R. Martin. Um, my second book was start was where I started to kind of get my own authorial voice, but it was still very much it was a sequel to the first one, so it was still very much following that George R. R. Martin esque kind of storytelling in a way, or at least trying to emulate that. Um, it really wasn't until my third book that I feel like I was where my my own authorial voice started coming in, and then currently um, now I'm pretty certain I've found my own voice now i just gotta like refine it but anyways this is game of thrones robert's rebellion and battle of the trident 283 after aegon's conquest um so i've got nothing uh to say here at the start of this video let's go ahead and dive in if this does well i i would love actually if this do did really well because i would love to watch more of these videos i would love to see um people's interpret different people's interpretations of these uh, fantastical uh, book battles that we don't really have definitive um, information regarding how they actually like went. Um, but anyways, let's dive in. It is the year 262 after Aegon's conquest, 35 years prior to the events that take place at the start of Game of Thrones. Aerys Targaryen, the second of his name, ascends to the Iron Throne in King's Landing. During the first years of his reign, the Seven Kingdoms were thriving and the ambitious young kings strived to maintain prosperity. The majority of the old administration was replaced with fresh faces. Shortly, Aerys befriended a young knight, Sir Tywin Lannister, heir of Casterly Rock. Being impressed by the Lannister's administrative prowess and ruthlessness, he soon brought Tywin to the royal court and appointed him as the Hand of the King. It was a smart move, as the new Hand perfectly complemented the King's shortcomings, whose desire was to be the greatest ruler the Seven Kingdoms had ever seen. While Aris boasted about his grandiose plans of building a new wall in the north, or a shiny marble city on the other bank of the Blackwater, it was Tywin who painstakingly worked to ensure that the Kingdoms would actually thrive. Years passed, and it was slowly becoming obvious that the realm's prosperity was in fact solely due to Tywin's merit, though he gained little love for his service, as he was- Well, here's the thing, this is where interpretation of Tywin comes in. My belief of Tywin is very much, he does things that uh, are going to directly benefit Castor, uh, Lan House Lannister. He's a very family legacy, like, uh, self-centered person in regards to that, right? Like, he wants to be attributed to the to everything or whatever, to the prosperity and stuff like that. But I think probably what Tywin was doing as Hand of the King is he was likely funneling some things to disproportionately um, boost the Westerlands, is my belief, my interpretation of what Tywin was doing as Hand of the King. ...was stern, insensitive, and brutally effective. Eris had quickly grown jealous of his Hand, and their relationship, which was never easy, complicated even more. The king's mental health degenerated over the years after multiple miscarriages and stillborns by his sister wife Rayla and the Duskendale mutiny, 
where Eris was captured by the mutineers and imprisoned. Eris was a Ares Targaryen was a bit stupid though. He fucking went to he was a dumbass in that for half a year. Although Lord Ty But also the Lord of Duskendale should not imprison the king because it's like even if like alright, let's say right, like it, it's just he was a total idiot, the Lord of Duskendale. Right? He take he imprisons his king. What do you think's gonna happen? You kill the king, you're gonna die. You let the king go, you're not gonna be forgiven, you're going to die. Right? Like <laughs> The defiance of Duskendale, that man was stupid. Tywin and Sir Barristan Selmy managed to free him. From then on, the king feared for his life. And actually, it was just Sir Barristan Selmy. It was what, uh, Tywin brought an army, um, but Lord Darklin was threatening to kill the king or something like that. And then, like, Barristan kind of got impatient and he went in fucking rogue or whatever and, like, fucking broke Ares Targaryen out. Did some badass shit or whatever, got Ares out, boom, we're good to go. And then Duskendale, Lord Darklin was killed. And didn't leave the Red Keep in King's Landing at all. His suspicious nature gradually plunged into paranoia, and Ares slowly descended into madness. He soon started to thwart Tywin's actions as a hand and belittle his achievements. But even after the death of his beloved wife, Tywin stood firmly at the King's side. Yet things started to change in 281 AC, when King Aerys appointed Tywin's son and heir, 15-year-old Jaime Lannister, as the youngest ever member of the King's Guard. On the surface, it was a great honor for House Lannister. Yet with this cunning move, Aerys stripped his hand of an heir. Lord Tywin, whose ambition was to restore the might of his house, was clearly enraged upon the King's decision and soon returned to Casterly Rock, giving up his position as Royal Counselor. It seemed that the Targaryen king finally accomplished his goal. Later that year, a great tournament in Harren Hall took place as part of the festivities celebrating the advent of spring, even though winter hit back twice as hard later that year. Anyway, many of the great lords gathered at Harren Hall, and even King Aerys himself attended the tourney. But he wasn't supposed to. The day belonged to Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, heir to the crown, who managed to unhorse and defeat several renowned opponents. Yet after the last bout was won, the champion was allowed to choose a new queen of love and beauty. I love the anim like, just the animation is very smooth in this uh, episode in this video. Surprisingly enough, Rhaegar rode past his own wife, Elia of Dawn, and bestowed the crown of blue roses to Lyanna Stark, daughter of the Lord of Winterfell. It was a scandalous act, not only because the crown prince was married, but also because Lyanna was already betrothed to Lord Robert Baratheon. Some time later, Rhaegar and Lyanna met again near Harren Hall, and soon both disappeared, using the help of the King's Guard. While Rhaegar's behavior during the Harren Hall tournament seemed to be forgiven, the supposed abduction of Lyanna Stark was just too much to bear for her brother, Brandon Stark, heir of Winterfell. Brandon, together with his retinue, was on his way to wed Caitlin Tully in Riverrun, but as soon as he heard the news about his sister, he picked his best men and rode he made a not smart decision. Straight to the capital. He reached the gates of the Red Keep and, being unaware that the prince was not there, shouted for Rhaegar to come out, demanding his life. Not a smart thing to do. <laughs> Saying that about the... M a the heir to the kingdom. Not a smart King thing. King Aerys had his company arrested for supposedly plotting the murder of the crown prince. And so I mean, that's kind of what they were doing. They were, like, Brandon Stark was shouting for his death. Summoned his father to answer the alleged crimes. Lord Rickard Stark soon arrived in King's Landing with 200 men and demanded a trial by combat. The king granted his request, but chose fire as the royal champion. While the Lord of Winterfell was burnt alive, Brandon strangled himself to death, trying to rescue his suffering father. Not a single Northman who accompanied Brandon and Rickard to the capital would ever see the North again. Afterwards, King Aerys demanded John Arryn, Lord of the Vale, to send in the heads of Robert Baratheon and Eddard Stark, who were at the Airy and who were most likely eager to avenge the death of the Northmen. But Lord Arryn refused to do so, and instead raised his banners in an open rebellion. The ravens were sent to all houses across the Seven Kingdoms to gain the much-needed support to oppose the Mad King. 
but other than the north and the majority of the Vale, only some parts of the Stormlands and Riverlands agreed to join the cause. The rest either stood by the king's side or, like Tywin Lannister, remained neutral. Ned Stark, now Lord of Winterfell, after the death of his father and older brother, travelled back home to gather an army in the north. Robert Baratheon did the same and took a ship south. Meanwhile, John Arryn successfully retook the city of Gultarn, occupied by Loyalist forces, and began to deal with those who failed to support the Overlord of the Vale. Where the fuck did he, where did he get this information regarding Sears? Because I don't remember a siege of Gulltown. Like In the Arryn. south, Robert encountered similar problems as John had, as some of the houses of the Stormlands neglected to gather forces to support their lord, and instead took the king's side. Yet Robert swiftly defeated his opponents in three separate encounters near Summerhall, and even managed to sway some of them to join the rebels' side. I know he fought, what was it, three battles in this one day? The next moons were marked by war preparations, and in late 282 AC, Robert finally departed Storm's End with his troops, marching to unite with the rebel forces in the north. Of course, those who remained loyal to the crown didn't just sit and wait. Fierce Lord Randall Tarly of Horn Hill leading the vanguard of the combined forces from the Reach, ambushed Robert's troops near Ashford and dealt a considerable blow. The main force of the Loyalists commanded by Lord Tyrell eventually joined Tarly's vanguard. But Robert regrouped and managed to retreat north, despite the losses. The Lord of Highgarden eventually gave up the pursuit and decided to march east and soon besieged Storm's End, the garrison of which was commanded by Robert's younger brother, Stannis Baratheon. That wasn't the Dennis end of the Robert's Manus. problems, though. The royal contingent under Lord John Connington departed the capital, hoping to intercept Robert's army. Connington traced them all the way to Stony Sept, where Robert tried to conceal himself using the help of the townsmen. Upon their arrival, the royal soldiers began to search for the rebels, but without much luck. Two days later, the united rebel forces under Lord Stark and Tully arrived from the north and engaged the royal troops. Fierce fighting began amid the town's streets and alleys. It is said that Robert Baratheon stepped out of a brothel to join the hmm. battle and dueled Lord Connington, almost killing him. True or not, Connington saw that his men were losing to the larger rebel force and commanded a general retreat. This was the first major victory for the rebels' side in the war. When King Aerys heard that the royal troops had lost, he impulsively stripped Lord Connington of his lands and titles and had him exiled. Yep. He also began to realize that the rebellion was far more serious than he had thought and could actually threaten his position. The Mad King ordered his alchemists to cache wildfire pots in various parts of King's Landing in order to burn down the entire city in case of defeat. But the war wasn't lost yet and Prince Rhaegar was summoned back to the capital where he assembled another bigger army. Using strong contingents from the Reach and Dawn and with help of loyal houses from all over the kingdom, he managed to gather some 40,000 men willing to defend the Iron Throne. Eventually, the royal army marched out of King's Landing in the middle of summer, heading north to quell the rebellion once and for all. The rebel force consisted predominantly of soldiers of the North, Vale, Stormlands, and Riverlands, though some of the houses of the latter three still supported King Aerys. The amassed rebel army counted to around 35,000 men in total, but what the rebel force lacked in numbers, it gained in battle experience and determination. When the scouts reported that Rhaegar's army was about to cross the Trident River, the rebels commanded by Robert marched to engage them. Battle ensued, just as the majority of the royal forces crossed the wide ford and were struck by the rebels. Tight combat raged for hours, as neither side was able to dominate the enemy. Even the successful charge led by the Veilmen, which smashed the advancing right flank of Leo and Martel and killed the Dornish prince, couldn't turn the tide of the battle. Ripperoni. Finally, somewhere in the center, Robert Baratheon reached the position of Crown Prince Rhaegar Targaryen and challenged him to single combat. Although Rhaegar managed to injure his opponent, Robert crushed the prince's chest with his warhammer in a- The cool, the one thing I love about this series though is how like, 
lucky Robert got because Robert, right? Robert is a fierce warrior. He is, I would argue, he is one of the best warriors of of the series, right? Um, he was an absolute beast in his prime. But Rhaegar Targaryen is said to have not been a fan of swords. He didn't care for fighting. Um, he only picked up the sword because, like, felt like he had to or something at some point. Like, his dad made him or something. Um, so, like, he managed to injure Robert Baratheon. Like, he put... Robert spent days, or if not weeks, in, like, recovering after his fight with Rhaegar. Despite Rhaegar not having really been someone as obsessed with fighting as Robert. Who actually was not even obsessed with it in any sort sort of the any sort of definition of the word. He was just someone that picked it up because for a little bit or whatever, because he felt he had to. He was being like forced to or something. Had Rhaegar been someone that cared about fighting, Robert would have probably lost. But also if Rhaegar was someone that cared about fighting, then his character probably would be a whole lot different and blah blah blah. In a killing blow, Rhaegar's armor shattered and rubies encrusting his breastplate scattered all around. The death of the Crown Prince had an immediate effect on his troops. In a matter of minutes, all of the royal forces were in full rout and the battle was essentially over. The rebels now had an unobstructed... Hmm. I love that little bit there of Lord Frey arriving late. I love that. An unobstructed route straight to the capital. Upon hearing who won the Battle of the Trident, Lord Tywin Lannister joined the war, gathering his army in Casterly Rock and rushed east to capture King's Landing. Robert hadn't recovered from his injury yet and requested his friend Lord Ned Stark to lead the vanguard of the rebel army to reach the capital before Tywin. But it was the Lannisters who arrived first and Tywin tricked the king, convincing him to open the city gates. While the capital was sacked and looted with no regard for the life of its people, the remaining Loyalist troops formed the last stand at the Red Keep. A few days prior to Tywin's arrival, King Aerys sent his wife and second son Viserys to the safety of Dragonstone Stronghold, yet refused to allow Rhaegar's wife Elia Martell and her children to leave with them, suspecting that Prince Leowen Martell betrayed Rhaegar at the Trident. <laughs> Seeing that all hope was lost, Eris ordered his master of pyromancers to ignite the wildfire and burn the city together with half a million of its inhabitants. Yet the lone member of the King's Guard guarding the King at the Red Keep, Sir Jamie Lannister, realized what Eris wanted to do and rushed to save the city by killing the head pyromancer. Being afraid that the Mad King could order another alchemist to ignite the wildfire, Jamie made an uneasy decision, broke his oath and slew the Mad King avoiding such catastrophe. Lord Tywin had to quickly find a way to prove his loyalty to the victors, so he ordered his bannermen Gregor Clegane and Amory Lorch to murder Princess Elia Martell and her children. While Robert was crowned in King's Landing, being the only head of a great house truly wanting the Iron Throne, Ned Stark rode south lifting the sea well and also he had the better claim to it because of his grandmother was a targaryen age of storm's end and reaching the tower of joy where he found his sister liana dying with a child in her hands the mad king was dead and the war was over after almost 300 years of undisputed rule house targaryen no longer held the iron throne and its last vestiges sought refuge in the east the love affair between Rhaegar and Lyanna triggered the conflict that ultimately cost them their very lives and set in motion the most fundamental shift of power in the Seven Kingdoms since Aegon's conquest and setting the stage for the Game of Thrones. Ooh. Okay, you can edit that out. <laughs> oh boy. When Rhaegar's wife brought forth the girl Rhaenys, the entire royal court celebrated, but King Aerys refused to even touch his granddaughter, stating that she smelled Dornish. This time I'll use this text to... Uh... This, was a, this was a very good video. Um, just after the sack of King's Landing, Queen 
Queen Rayla crowned her second son Viserys as the new king of Dragonstone. A few moons later, Stannis Brandon assaulted the island, forcing the Targaryens to flee east. I think this was a very good video. I was expecting maybe a little bit more. I don't know why, but I don't think right. I was kind of expecting a little bit more detail regarding the Battle of the Trident, but I don't think we have that information available to us at all. So, like, it's fine. Um, House Greyjoy joined the rebellion after the Battle of the Trident, hoping to secure some spoils of war. Yet the attack on the Reach was only partially successful, as Lord Quellen Greyjoy was killed and some of the longboats were lost. This was Game of Thrones, Robert's Rebellion, and Battle of the Trident 283 AC. Um, this didn't really provide too much more detail than those, if you've read the book, are already aware of. Um, but I still think this was a it was a very well made video. Um, I think it was very. The length was good for what it was covering, um, and there were some bits there that um, I wasn't entirely familiar with or that I forgot about, so that was nice to kind of get that information, um, like uh, the movement of Robert Baratheon and whatnot, I think was very nice. Um, yeah, I just loved how they mapped everything here. Great. Fantastic. 10 out of 10. I hope you guys enjoyed this as well. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. I have no clue if I'm going to title this historian or fantasy author react. Peace. <laughs>